people filing in at the bottom. Yeah, start climbing. It's so much more orderly than waiting for everybody to take their seats in a auditorium. Stumbling in late. Yeah. <laughs> we can't see them, but we know they're out there. Um, all right, if you're ready. Um, Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. We have what promises to be a very engaging program for you this evening, featuring Alice Mc McDermott talking about her new book, What About the Baby? Some Thoughts on the Art of Fiction. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. To post a question at uh, any point during the event, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. In the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of What About the Baby? Like many other uh, authors, uh, Alice was an avid reader as a child. And as she was quoted saying last weekend in the Buy the Book section of the New York Times Book Review, she realized early on uh, there were those who read books because they're required and those who read them because they're everything. Uh, for Alice, of course, they became her life and Led, uh, led to quite an accomplished career as a writer. Uh, her evocative nuanced novels about Irish American life have been popular and critically acclaimed and won a bunch of awards, among them the National Book Award for Charming Billy and three Pulitzer finalist nominations for That Night uh, at Weddings and Wakes and After This. And Alice also spent more than two decades teaching writing as a professor of humanities at Johns Hopkins University, and a member of the faculty at the Swanee Writers' Conference. Her conference lectures served as a basis uh, for her latest work, of What About Baby?, uh, which both Kirkus and Publishers Weekly have called a master class in fiction writing. Drawing on personal stories, as well as on numerous examples from other great writers, Alice examines uh, what, uh, what makes tales worth reading, and addresses aspects of, uh, of craft ranging from uh, first sentences and opening paragraphs to, to endings. Her love of fiction and the art of writing um, uh, are, are apparent, um, PW noted, and her advice is at once encouraging and direct. We're delighted to have in conversation with Alice another excellent author, uh, Matt Clam who was recognized early in his career as one of the best young fiction writers in the country and continues to be praised as an exceptionally talented storyteller. His most recent book is Who is Rich? He's also done some magazine writing and, and taught creative writing in a number of places, including Johns Hopkins University, St. Albans School, American University, and Stockholm University in Sweden. So uh, Alice and, uh, and Matt, the screen is yours. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Um, so, uh, Alice, I have. Um, I have Hi, Matt. <laughs> Hi, Alice. <laughs> I'm just moving your you around the screen here. Um, Alice, I have I have stolen energy from your fiction more times than I can count. I'll be sitting there with my own work, losing hope. And a book of yours might be nearby and I'll pick it up wondering, how did she do it in that night? Take a teenager with a marginal boyfriend and a father who has suddenly dropped dead and turn her into a bolt of lightning. Or in someone, how did she transform a tired young woman who nearly died in childbirth two months earlier into a fiery emblem of hope, gratitude, courage, and a reckless regard for life? I will read your work, close the book, take a look at the sentence I'm on, and then know that I can now make it better. Um, for eight years, you and I overlapped at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and since you live nearby, maybe twice a year, there'd be a reason to carpool a department meeting or something. And on those occasions, I think I'll have Alice in my car for an hour. I have no idea what I'm doing as a writer. I should ask her what I'm doing. Uh, I never quite figured out the right questions to ask, but now um, I don't have to. 
Uh, you are the author of eight novels, winner of the National Book Award, and a finalist for every major literary prize. And now in your ninth book, What About the Baby? You've collected essays written over the years from craft lectures you gave at the Swanee Writers Conference into this handy package full of advice any writer might need. I wonder, Alice, if we might start with that uh, section on page 101 that we were talking about earlier. Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you. I, I miss those uh, those wonderful conversations uh, in in your car between here and Baltimore. Um, and thank you, everyone out there. Um, I wish we were in person. We could all get pizza afterwards. Um, but uh, this comes from um, an essay called "Only Connect." Uh, parenthetical. Eventually. I didn't want to completely rip off um, Foster, so I added my eventually. Take five minutes to write your novel or five years. The reader will enter the novel on the first page and finish it with the last, with no thought of the time you've spent on this sentence as opposed to that one. Write your first chapter in February and discover in June that it's really your second chapter and then recast it again in November as the third. For the reader who picks it up a year later or 40 years later, it is and always will be the third chapter of the novel. My agent, Harriet Wasserman, used to assure me when I feared I was taking too long between books, something we often talked about in the car, <laughs> that no book review ever began, this novel would have been better if it came out two years ago. No one, she said, remembers when something was published. They only remember what was published. What is memorable then? is not the saga of how the author knew or didn't know the story when she began to compose it. What is memorable is the sense of inevitability, of nothing superfluous, nothing wasted, of meaning and consequence revealing itself, resonating page after page after page in the completed work. Forster called story, quote, a narrative of events arranged in time sequence, end quote. But he goes on to say that plot, quote, is also a narrative of events, the emphasis falling on causality. The king died and then the queen died is a story. The king died and then the queen died of grief is a plot. This sense of causality reveals itself to the reader page by page in time, but that's not necessarily how it reveals itself to the writer. That's great. Thank you for indulging. A good excuse for taking very long between both. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a, 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 a section that I, I asked if you would read because I think it's a good example of what's in this book as you move smoothly between your own hard won insights and those of other writers, their advice and analysis, as well as all these technical details for the novel writing aficionado and anyone who's ever labored, labored over a book. There are essays here that for whatever reason really spoke to me and I just couldn't let go of and I could spend this entire time talking about your essay sentencing. Um, it begins with a personal anecdote a tossed off comment from a poet who's a fan of yours who says, you sure do love a sentence, which set you off worrying uh, about with what the poet meant in a way that is so hilarious that I won't paraphrase it, but I'll just remind the audience that all writers are crazy and Alice is one of them. <laughs> you, you made me laugh a dozen times in, in, with your insecurities and honesty and vulnerability. But then in that essay, you really get to work and you start by discussing uh, first sentences, offering a few examples of ones you think are worth studying, like Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. And then you weave into the essay these things a reader might hear in that line. Uh, then you say the first sentence will strike a chord, a tone, a mood. But then you warn the reader, and I really love this, um, that you have no formula to offer for what makes a good sentence, although you talk around and about it 
throughout the book and no formula for how to write one. And then you go ahead and warn writers that creating a mind blowing sentence of any kind is not the goal. I really love that too. Um, there's a, there is a, a terrific section on page 47 uh, that I also thought maybe if you would indulge me and read, I, I thought it's very uh, well, um, it, it just does this uh, a better job than I could of. Uh... Sure, yeah, you know, it, it occurs to me, um, especially looking at the, the excerpts that, that, that you wanted me to know, um, there, there's a there's an awful lot in, in um, these bits of advice of trying to reassure the writer, young or old or starting out or uh, at it forever, um, to uh, not be self-conscious. Um, you know, just uh, serve the story, serve the language um, and get everything else locked out of your room. Um, so this is a little bit more of that. <laughs> In my experience, the far superior first sentence, sentences buried on page two or seven or 18 of a work in progress are sentences that have appeared without pre-planning. Sentences, sentences written according to no formula, no scheme. Sentences that are formed not in moments of determined inspiration or the huffing pursuit of brilliance, but in the pen to paper, fingers to the keyboard, pickaxe to hard rock daily work of getting a story told. The kind of sentence that surprises and delights even the writer herself when it is called to her attention as a possible a preferable beginning. When I consider those memorable first lines in literature from Tolstoy to Tilly Olson's, the single thing they all seem to have in common is authority. A word in this context, perhaps easier to define by what it is not than by precisely what it is. Call me Ishmael, for instance, is not I suppose you could say I've gone by a lot of different names in my life. After all, I was a small shy kid and I was picked on a lot, but out of all the names and nicknames I've had over the course of my 25 years, I'd probably prefer that you refer to me by the one that you might think sounds somewhat old fashioned or even, I don't know, kind of biblical, like my mother was some kind of evangelical or something, which she wasn't. She was agnostic, although she did read the Bible when she couldn't find anything else to read. If there is an unwritten preamble to call me Ishmael, it is something like sit down, shut up, listen. I love that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you uh, throughout that section you you caution writers that a, a gorgeous sentence can be a byproduct of good storytelling, but maybe shouldn't be the goal. And uh, you're getting at something there, which you talk about indirectly and directly throughout the book, which I cannot paraphrase here, but has a little of that life happens while you're making plans. <laughs> right. <laughs> And uh, you, you then go on to say, loving a gorgeous sentence. Um, well, I think you're, what you're getting at is uh, it's a little bit of a warning. It's a little like loving an exceptionally attractive person. You, you might not belong together, but it's really hard to know and it'll probably end in heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> then you go on to say about a great sentence, no linguistic somersaults here, only gorgeous clarity. Clarity, omit needless words. Yes, I just think that's great advice. Yeah, well, I, I also quote Eudora Welty saying something um, to the effect that um, there's there needs to be something inadvertent in all beauty. Um, that 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 trying too hard, um, that working too hard on it, a little bit too much makeup, a little bit too much finesse, maybe too many adjectives. Um, maybe just a little bit uh, out of this world. Um, and again, going back to which I think is the, you know, the drumbeat that, that I hear in my, in my own passages, um, forget about yourself. 
Mm. You know, this isn't this this novel is not meant to show how brilliant you are. Mm. This novel is meant to bring us into the lives of your character and the world you're creating. Mm. Um, it ain't about you, um, even though. As you know, most of us have tremendous egos. That's why we think we can um, completely remake the world in a better way than the original creator made it. <laughs> and you, in that same essay, you give two examples of James Woods' uh, praise of very fancy words and sentences in his reviews in the New Yorker of books by um, uh, uh, contemporary writers. And then you mention a, a few key things, just sort of pointing out um, in a, an analysis of how the prose is overcooked and, uh, and that he goes on and on praising their prose. And then in both cases, he, uh, he finds both books lacking, um, which I think is funny and uh, sort of um, another warning um, to uh, writers that the, uh, the beauty of a perfect sentence um, might be a distraction. Um, yeah, and you know this from teaching too, Matt. I mean, the, the, the most wonderful moment when you're talking with a, a new writer or uh, about a new work um, is that moment when you as the first reader or one of the first readers um, see something in the manuscript, in a, in a paragraph that the writer hasn't seen himself. Um, and, and you read out and you say, that sentence is beautiful. And the reason it's beautiful is because the writer didn't know it was beautiful. The writer was creating the world and, and so busy, <laughs> you know, making sure that everything was authentic and it was true. And it was a little scary because I wasn't quite sure where I was going with this. And that's how uh, the language um, at the service of the story and the character rises um, to a level that first reader can say, oh my gosh, I love that. It's never when the reader says, how about that? The writer says, how about that really nice? Did you like that really beautiful sentence I wrote? Because usually it's like, yeah, that's what you got to cut. I, I your darling there. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't help but remember um, uh, a writer saying to me, um, it just reminded me of this conversation about um, writers getting really uh, attached to a gorgeous sentence. Uh, he said, I have a title. I actually have 156 titles that I wanna try on for you for a short story. And he, I said, and he wanted, first he wanted to read them out loud. And I was like, why don't you just let me <laughs> look at them? But even before that, I would like to read the story first. And he said, I haven't written the story yet. Yeah. He just had the he just had the 156 titles, and he thought if he got those right, then he could proceed from there. <laughs> um, you also, in your um, essay, only connect in parentheses. Eventually, you begin by giving this very straightforward right, advice to novelists. You say that as you write, go back to the start and read what you've already written. Just because you're on chapter eight doesn't mean the first seven chapters are set in stone. In fact, you say, the truth of the matter is this, until the work of your heart and your mind and your hands meet the bookbinder's work of paper and ink and paste or thread, your novel is a fluid thing, an unpredictable thing. And every page, every paragraph, every sentence you add runs the delightful risk of changing everything that has come before. That is actually a sort of terrifying proposition. So I guess what you're saying is that a person could be on page 900 of their book, they've been working for three years and they come across something years into it that um, forces them to reconsider um, everything that came before and to have to look at page one again. Yeah. See the book through a different uh, lens. I mean, it's sort of astonishing that um that that should be advice that we have to give. Um, you're, you're working on a novel, why don't you read it? <laughs> you know? um, but there, and I think a lot of it, I understand it. There's the, you know, oh my gosh, I don't wanna have to change it. Um, or the sense of accomplishment. I have written 300 pages. I only have 50 more to go. So I don't really need to rewrite it. Um, but as you know, the, you know, the, the way a novel is composed, the way our minds work, that each thing you add to it, even to the last line, um, changes the stakes for everything that's come before. 
Um, I mean, I've been known to, to tell young writers, well, look, sweetheart, if you don't want to read it again, how do you think anybody else is going to want to read it for the first time? Um, but, but there is that, I mean, it's, it's dreadful and frightening. Um, and it speaks to that, how long are you taking between novels? Because I thought I wrote the first line and having written what I thought was the first line, I went back and read the whole thing over and realized there's a whole part of the novel that I haven't connected to the rest or that I need to develop or that I need to get rid of. Um, so it's gonna be another year, <laughs> but that's also where the magic happens. You know, the, the, the magic for a reader as well as for the writer because you know a writer is the first reader of your own work and the things you look for as a reader, are there things you should be looking for in your own work as a writer? So that wonderful, oh my gosh, I didn't, I, that is exactly right, but I didn't see that coming. Or, oh my gosh, that character um, did something that I, now that I look at it, I should have known he was gonna do because uh, it was all there. Those kinds of thrills, the, the, the delight, that sense that if I hadn't read this novel, I would never have seen the world that way. I never would have known that. Um, those are the same things as the first reader of this novel, meaning the writer, um, also needs to look for. So it is that sense of everything you add somehow changes the stakes for everything um, that you thought was uh, written stone. <laughs> I think it's just part of the, yeah, I guess if there, I, I, I would not do a good job of summing up uh, the thematic, uh, the theme of this book, partly because it's essays, but partly because um, there's just so many ideas in it. But I think uh, Casey Kasem, keep your feet on the ground, but keep reaching for the stars or the <laughs> Prophet Muhammad's a trust in God, but tie your camel. Both of those <laughs> things I, I think speak to some of what you're talking about here, which is bet on yourself to mm -hmm. change the world and yourself with what you're working on and bet on yourself to a, a, approach and attack big questions, but also do the diligence of mm -hmm. describing on, in a granular detail what the kitchen smells like and how the wooden floor shone after it was polished. And um, those two things, uh, those two seemingly contradictory uh, uh, attitudes seem to uh, uh, be Im important to have sort of ride in parallel as you work. And I think reading your own work is part of that. Part of that. And it's also, you know, the, um, it, it's, it's like your student with the titles, but no story. <laughs> you know, it's easy to forget that when you're writing fiction, um, the language is everything. It's not a report about something that's that's already happened. Um, and you know, and I know being a journalist is a hard work, and telling a good story that actually happened is just as challenging as as making this stuff up. But the difference, I think, is that in fiction, um, since everything is created, the way a sentence is formed makes a difference, and and the the absolute magic of language. When you think about, you know, when you form a sentence, when I form a sentence, when you form a sentence, it's always going to be different and it's going to be informed by the way we use language. You know, how did you get your first language? Who did you listen to? What have you read? What did you hear? What were the conversations? All the things that shape the way we use words are brought to bear when you begin writing fiction because without language, this world doesn't exist. These characters don't exist. It's not a report. So, you know, all that, that um, sort of calling up, not only your autobiography, uh, <laughs> because it is the way you use language that's different from the way anyone else uses language, um, but it's also, I think, you know, tapping into the subconscious, that idea of um, I don't know my story until I begin to tell it and how I tell it will be as important to how the story is shaped 
than anything having to do with the subject of the story. I think there's also a sort of a technical or tactical or whatever issue, which is the fact that, I mean, you mentioned that an intelligent reader picks up uh, each new fact and remembers. And that's a great thing for the writer to remember that you're, you are hoping for an intelligent reader and that reader is hungry to solve that puzzle. Um, but an intelligent novelist likewise picks up new facts and remembers. And there are a lot of facts in a novel and sometimes it's hard to hold them all. And I think you're also encouraging a writer to go back and reread because you can be in, enlightened by the things you've already said, surprised or relieved, and that can help feed the beast that you're struggling with at the line you've ended on. Exactly, yeah. And again, it's that, it's, it's, um, that sense that you can't always plan. Mm. Um, so that wonderful moment when you're talking to a, a writer, you know, f about a new work and you say, um, oh, look, you know, that gesture that the character made on page three is repeated on page 30, but it's the meaning of it has completely changed. And the writer looks at you and goes, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I just, I needed a gesture. I didn't realize it was the same gesture. Maybe I should, it, did I repeat it? And, but once you see it, then you say, ah, as the author, I can make use of that. I didn't know I was going to have that gesture repeated 30 pages later, but now that I've seen it, I can make use of it. I know something more about the character. I know something more about the story I'm telling. Um, and again, then there's that sense of discovery um, that, a, that a writer has just as a reader wants it. And you can't get away from your own proclivities. So you have this gesture in mind, um, but then it, maybe if you delve and you realize, why am I repeating this gesture? It's because it's important and it has some essential meaning. Um, well, as you know, the other side of it is, nah, I just repeated that gesture and it really doesn't mean <laughs> anything. Right. Um, no, um, then you got to take it out, right? right. Because right. it's, uh, you know, the one thing that we understand, um, whether we're, faithful or faithless or of, of, of any religious ilk, all of us as readers understand when we enter a novel that there's a creative intelligence that has made, brought this thing into life, um, brought it into being. We don't have to agree that there's a creative intelligence behind the world that we live in, but there's no doubt that um, nobody else composes novels, but human beings. Um, and, and we know that there's, there's a human being who has put these words down. And so in some ways that, that demands meaning. Um, you know, uh, again, for nonfiction, you can say, well, it just happened, I was just recording it. But in fiction, everything's a choice. Um, so if there is a creative intelligence, um, the, there should be some meaning to every choice that's made. I listened to a, a podcast, it was a, um, a talk you gave, and it was something about uh, the astonishment of love and the sacramental imagination. And I was trying to think of examples of the sacramental imagination. And I was thinking, as I was thinking about it, I was up in Vermont sitting by a pond and the dragonfly landed on my hand. And I thought, well, whoever thought of the, the, the design of that dragonfly was definitely uh, a good designer and, uh, <laughs> and, and had ambition and had um, a, a sense of an, an aesthetic um, that is really noteworthy. Um, yeah, and I, for the novelist, it's not just that the dragonfly exists, but that the dragonfly landed at that moment within sight of this particular character who was having these thoughts. <laughs> so, right. so really, we we have novelists have a much tougher time than the than the. <laughs> creator. <laughs> right. we, we have many more levels than the creator has. Um, when you, um, uh, so this is one of those uh, in the car ride to Baltimore questions I should have asked you. What about, um, this is not something that you brought up and I think it's a much more important lesson to reread your work, but what about rereading your own work so many times that you become dulled to it, you become, um, you know, blind and deaf to it. How do you counteract the dulling of the senses, you know, or of the 10th or the 100th or the 500th reading of a, of a work? Um, 
that's a question I'm just sneaking in here for my own. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a risk, isn't it? It's a yeah. risk. Um, but there are different ways that we read. You know, um, there, there's the, the required reading kind of reading. Um, yeah, 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 I'm going over, I'm turning the pages. Um, but I think rereading with purpose and, and rereading, again, um, taking something that, that has occurred on page 300 Mm. And now using that as a filter mm. um, or a focus mm. and now rereading what was written six months ago or a year ago that I think I know. But in light of that, um, that's one way to think about it. Um, but I think so, the other way is, is also, you know, when, when I was putting this book together, one of the big uh, conversations I had with my editor was how long should the quotes be from other writers? Right. I you know, um, and and I wanted all of them, <laughs> and I and I wanted them to be long. But I also understand I'm a reader too, and often a block quote is like, you know, what you want me to read all that. <laughs> but as as I said to my editor, um, how can I be talking about the joy of the art of the literary arts and say? Yeah, but you don't want to read that. Right. <laughs> you know, let me just summarize it for right. you because you don't want to really see the words. You know, <laughs> you're not going to be able to get through this page and a half. Right. Before. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful, but you don't right. want to read it. <laughs> My God, it's too much to read. <laughs> <laughs> so I so so with the assumption that anyone who picks up this book is someone who loves to read, um, as I do, uh, you have to say, "Oh no, look at this. Look at the." I don't want to just give you a sample of this. I want you to really taste it, get, get the, um, so, so yeah. So a whole short story. Yeah. You got to read the whole short story um, because it's not only because it helps me to make my point as a teacher, but because it's just wonderful and we love wonderful writing. I, I, um, I can't help wonder because you do such a, a nice job of, of, uh, of exploring your own vulnerability as a writer and thinker, if you would, I, uh, I'm putting you on the spot here, whether the same thing happened uh, to you as you wrote these essays that may have happened as you learn what it is you, you think as you write a novel, when you assembled the final product here, um, what, I mean, does your own advice that you give remain fixed for you? In ten years, if you go back and reread this book, will you will you have any moments where you say, "I wonder whether I still like believe what I wrote in an earlier essay?" And which you can answer that or not. You can leave that as a rhetorical sort of <laughs> question. I can lead into this terrific essay you wrote called "Advice from Me to Me," where essentially you are kind of bringing this whole idea up. Uh, it's a wonderful essay where you say, "Here's a bunch of advice I wish I had when I was just starting out that I'm going to offer the younger me now." And it's, um, it's really great. Um, and I also came to the conclusion that the younger me would have paid no attention to, <laughs> to this advice and, and rightly so. I think probably um, if there's one thing I suspect uh, looking back and, and many of these essays I've, I've written over a number of years, um, uh, uh, every, and I think I, think I maybe indicate this a little bit somewhere in honesty. Um, in all honesty, all advice about writing um, can be thrown out. You can, you can do what you, uh, Flannery O'Connor said, you can do whatever you can get away with, you just can't get away with much. Um, but you know, that wonderful sense of, and, and I think it appeals to the contrarian in every fiction writer. Um, I'm not, this world, it doesn't make sense, but I, my world will make sense or my world will be beautiful or my world will be horrific in an interesting way, not the way the actual world is. Um, you can do whatever you can get away with. And, and the contrarian in us should always say, you're telling me don't do this? You're telling me don't write a story like this? You're telling me read over my whole novel while I'm writing it? Well, to hell with you. I know how to do it and I'm going to create something you've never seen. Love it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's advice, but, um, but, but the option to reject should always be the first option. 
the first, I don't know if you ever read Brenda Eulen's book. Um, I think it's called So You Want to Write or something like that. I, the first year I was writing, I took it and I tore it in half and I threw it on the floor of my truck. I was so <laughs> angry that she was trying to tell me how to do anything. But I love what you say too, which is you said, if I had the chance to advise the younger me, I would pass. And the reason I would pass is because she already knows she wants to be a writer. She's already got F. Scott Fitzgerald in her ears and she's got the stars in her eyes and she's already busy learning the hard lessons on her own. Um, so I guess I wonder, did you, when you were younger, um, were you open to the advice of accomplished writers? Do you remember having uh, either books by famous writers, some of which you quote in, in this book, or just uh, sort of moments where uh, people said things that meant something to you early on that really uh, opened some doors for you? Yeah, I, mean, I think we all want, you know, we want guidelines <laughs> because uh, because this is scary. Um, and, and, and the thought that, that we would be telling a story, or start out to tell a story that may be 300, 400, even 500 pages long mm. and, and start out not knowing where mm. it's going to end or even what's going to happen on page 30. Um, so, I, yeah, so, so I think grabbing <laughs> uh, advice from anywhere um, but I was fortunate in the writing teachers that I had early on um, who just told me, go read mm. and don't read, don't read books about writing, read novels, find out what you love. If you, how can you, how can you recognize what you're trying to do if you haven't recognized what moves you in other people's work? So find those writers who the, the Nabokov um, mm. advice the, um, don't read books with your head, don't read books with your heart, read them with your spine. Mm. And, and the writing that puts that chill in your spine, mm. um, that's, well, that's what you'll learn from. Mm. Um, everything else is technical and sometimes it, it's encouraging and sometimes it makes you feel less alone um, or crazy. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, reading, reading, the, the, the writers who you see doing what you think literature should do, that's, that's, those are the best teachers. Um, I'm gonna ask you one or two more things and then we're gonna get to, well, I see some questions coming in here. Um, there's this terrific essay called Starting Over where you essentially uh, talk about cheating on your one book with your other book. And, uh, <laughs> but you also are telling us, this is, these are the feelings associated with a piece of, 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 of work. And there are two different kinds of feelings. You describe this semester you spent as a visiting writer. We arrive with 200 pages of what was supposed to be your second novel after having received terrific reviews and a lot of success for your first book. Can you describe how you felt about that book and what happened while you were there supposedly to finish that, that second book? Yeah, and again, I th um, this is a young writer's, um, self-consciousness. Um, I, I had a second novel well along. My editor who had published my first book um, had seen it and I had signed a contract and it was going to come out and um, I had a chance to, to, um, to be a writer in residence all by myself. So it was going to be solitary. I'm just going to finish this easy. It's going to be great. And it's so good. It's so moving and profound. And oh, I've really thought about this. And um, this, is this is going to get those reviews that um, her first novel was promising. But here now the promise has come to fulfillment. I saw all that. And I got, you know, Nobody to disrupt me, nobody to interrupt, no children at that time knocking on the door. I wasn't, you know, I had one class I had to teach. Um, and I was bored to death with this story that I knew so well, I just had to write it down. Um, and I wrote every day and um, yeah, it was just uh, not doing it for me. Um, uh, and I didn't like feeling like I had to finish it. Mm. So I, I literally, I had a desk in this sweet little cottage in Virginia that they had given me because I was the writer in residence. Um, 
I literally, yeah, I was cheating on the one. I literally went into the kitchen away from where the desk was and wrote at the kitchen table. So like that novel wouldn't know <laughs> and started to just make up a story that interested me. The, what was happening is that there were some characters in that other novel that I was losing control of. They kept like wanting to talk about childhood memories. And that wasn't what this novel was about. This was a, this was a very, very serious, deeply, deeply moving story. And these characters wanted to talk about what they remembered when they were kids. Um, so I, I went off, literally um, closed the door on one and went to the kitchen table. And, um, and I had no idea what this story was. I had no idea where it was gonna go. I didn't even know if it was gonna be a story or a novel or a short novel. Um, but as soon as I did that, I remembered the joy of, um, of exploring, of discovering a new world. Um, and again, that, that little tingle in your spine when you say, oh, God, I don't know what this is, but it's mine and I have to pursue it. Did you feel like you were going to be punished for misbehaving? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was, I had a contract. I didn't know how these things worked. Right. Um, um, and fortunately, uh, Jonathan Galassi, who's, who is still my editor um, and has been my editor for all these years and is the person who encouraged me to put these essays together. Um, when I finally went, went back and said, you know, that novel that I showed you those 200 pages of, uh, but I have another one. And he, and he literally said to me, oh, well, you know what you're doing. <laughs> and I thought, oh, sweetheart, I am right. the last person in the world <laughs> who knows what she's doing. <laughs> I love that. Um, I'm gonna throw some of these questions your way. Um, uh, uh, can you please uh, talk a little about the ninth hour? I just loved it, maybe because it was a mystery. I didn't hear it mentioned at all in the introduction. And then um, I, if you are stumped by or have very little to say about any of these questions, I have a bunch and can go on. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, uh, I, love the, I love that description of the ninth hour as a mystery. Um, I think that's what it is. Um, that, that was my very Catholic nun novel. Um, uh, I have moved on since then. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, what advice do you have uh, about how to approach the knotty intersection of choices regarding point of view narrator and voice? Mm. Um, that, that's a great question. And, and, and one um, I think all of us uh, are confronted with. And, and I think the answer again is, is back to this, uh, this drum I've, I'm beating in this book, um, just write. Stop thinking about it. Um, you know, you know the the oh, first person, third person, first person, third person. Just start writing. Um, I think we can sometimes uh, tie ourselves into mm -hmm. knots. Um, yeah, everything you write has a bazillion alternatives, mm -hmm. um, and you know it's you just have to get to the point that you say, I hear this, or I'm not sure I hear it, but I'm pursuing it. Um, is it the right voice? You'll find out mm. if you write, if you write, not if you think about it, not if you call up your friends, not if you moan about it over a bottle of wine. Um, if you write, if you hear, if you start putting the sent, doing the work of putting the sentences together. Mm. Um, you know, I've, I've had moments when I've told young writers, oh, for God's sake, first person is not that different from a close third person. Just get over it. Start writing. When you have 50 pages, then if you want to change it, and I've done this myself, um, I changed a whole novel um, after telling people it doesn't make that much difference. Um, but, but I would never have known I had to change that novel from third person to first person if I hadn't written 200 pages of it because that's when I knew what I had and who I had. Um, so it's, yeah, just that's great. make mistakes, be wrong, but write. Um, here's a question, does writing energize or deplete you? 
<laughs> I would definitely say the answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Both things at the same time. Right? <laughs> um, uh, this is an interesting question. Having written so eloquently, Alice, about your craft, supported by the magnificent passages from others that you use throughout, do you think your next work will be more difficult, more conscious about how high the bar is, how serious and grand the goal? Can you talk about your future work? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I think those of us who, who write and teach um, uh, or in any way public writers um, are a bit schizophrenic. Um, and there's all that we say as I'm doing now, <laughs> you know, all this pontificating about craft um, and and the writers we love and how hard it is and how um, energizing it is and depleting it is. And we said, but when you are just being the storyteller alone in your room, wrestling those words, um, it means nothing. That's, that's part of the stuff that you have to lock out. Um, what I wrote before, what anybody said about it, um, any bragging that I've done, any impression that I've given anyone that I, I know how to do this, you lock that out. Um, you're a novice every time. And the only thing that matters when you're composing is the composition itself, the language, the character, the story. Um, everything else you have to bar the door <laughs> and, and not let them in. And that includes um, all the work that came before. So um, yeah, I think setting the bar too high because you're, um, you're trying to tell people how to do this. Um, I think that's a legitimate thing to worry about, but that's not allowed in my workroom. And you, uh, I, uh... To I the, the, that this question has now vanished from the uh, our, our oh I see it's in the answered um, this was um, from from Eleanor Hagenbottom and she, and I, I have to say Eleanor that that uh, Alice very eloquently addresses this exact problem when one of the other moms at drop off <laughs> said so you're working on another novel somebody die in that one too <laughs> and you suddenly realized when you got home that day that you had every review every voice every book that had ever been written that sounded like anything you might be doing in it for you uh for a while and you had to learn to clear your desk and just do what it was you knew that you were made of and that uh, uh you were going to do anyway once you silenced the had the very helpful drop off kindergarten uh, mom friend. Uh. <laughs> oh, is this one? Is someone going to die in this one again? Somebody dies in all your novels, <laughs> or they know somebody who died, or they're going to die. What? You know? You're aware of death. How do you keep? Having it's like, well, I'm sorry, I don't know anybody who doesn't know somebody who dies. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they're going to make their way into my novel, but yeah, I mean, there's so much that we have to. Um, so I've sometimes said to students, you put yourself at the service of the story and the character and nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that you have to find the language that best serves the story and the character. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that doesn't mean you don't think about it. I mean, that doesn't mean that, that there aren't points where I say, well, I'm never writing about another effing Irish American again. So there, <laughs> and nobody's going to die in this one. Nobody's going to even know anybody who dies. So there, <laughs> you know? or even I have to make a point, or I think I really need to say something about um, politics in the 20 2021, all that stuff doesn't belong. You got to, you got to keep it out. Mm. language, character, story. Oh my God, that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I like when you get on this, so there, that's really, um. so, okay. So Susan Littman asks, how does a writer cling to their honest commitment to the writing while working in such a commercial environment that measures success with a different ruler? Um, how does a writer cling to their honest commitment to the writing while working in such a commercial environment? I guess, is that the, the world itself? Um, sure. It's a yeah. it's a world of capitalism and stuff that measures success with a different ruler. Sure. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I am not saying any of this is easy. 
Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and that's another part of it. Um, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with commercial success and there are nothing, there's nothing wrong with sheer entertainment um, from a novel. Um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, putting a velvet picture of Elvis over your couch, if that's what you like, um, that's fine. Uh, but I think those of us who think that the literary arts are somehow essential, um, or those of us who um, are driven to do this and we're not quite sure why and know we would do it um, no matter what, uh, without readers, you write your first stories when you wanna be a, a serious writer without anybody asking you to do it. Um, nobody's forcing you to take that creative writing class. Um, quite the opposite, probably. Um, you know, how about computer science? Much better um, accounting. Um, but I, you know, if you, if you believe in, when I think all of us who pursue this do, the, the value of this art, um, then all those things not that you don't worry about them, not that you don't wish otherwise, um, but they cannot have anything to do with the pursuit itself. Um, and if, if you're after you know, the fame and fortune, um, then there's a certain kind of novel that you might be pursuing. I don't have anything to offer if that's what you're after. <laughs> um, good for you and Godspeed, but I don't have anything to offer. Um, I'm, I'm the person who puts whole short stories inside her essays because I'm sure you're gonna love the language in this story that even if it's a block print, you're gonna read the whole thing. Um, so if, if you're one of those, come with me, we'll talk about literature. <laughs> That's great. And Kathleen Gibbons uh, asks, can you talk about the way you shape the passage of time in your short novel, Someone, there's a sense of time passing decades through generations in less than 250 pages. Yeah, you know, one of the things, and this is maybe more shop talk um, than, than everyone's interested in, but, um, you know, one of the things that happens to us, I think, when, when we're telling a story is that, that we tie ourselves up, I mean, writers, um, uh, with narrative time, uh, with sequence, um, with things that at first feel like kind of guardrails, you know, well, I'll start this in 1898 and I'll end it in 1998 and each chapter will be a decade. And boy, that's great. That's like holding on to the side of the pool, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but we have, as creators of these fictional worlds, complete authority to do whatever we want with time. You know, it's one of the marvelous and wonderful things about reading a novel. Um, so it may seem intimidating. I'm going to cover an a person's entire life, um, but I'm not tied to the dailiness of it. Um, and as I've often said to my, to my writing students, there is this really handy tool that most people who don't write fiction aren't aware of, and it's called a space break. And, and if you find I can't get out of this damn day and I want to, I want to cover the next hundred years and I can't get this character to go to bed so the, so the sun can come up, um, space break, uh, leap ahead, um, bring in another voice. Sometimes when you're composing a novel that's, oh no, this was supposed to be a single voice point of view. Um, try it. Uh, so we have tremendous freedom uh, and, and it is only that sense of, um, I don't know where I'm going. This might not work. I may end up throwing all this out. I may have to cut out these next hundred pages, but I'm gonna forge ahead because something instinctively is saying uh, straight narrative isn't gonna work here. That's great. Um, uh... An anonymous attendee uh, says, I believe I once heard you uh, say that you retype the next day what you've written the previous day. Is this true? Do you still do this? What about this process is most helpful? Yeah, well, typing. <laughs> I still reread. I have to. Um, everything that, that I'd written the day before, before adding anything to it. I'm not quite as mechanically um, uh, committed 
to retyping as I was when I had my little uh, portable Corona <laughs> and, and was writing on that. But, but still there is that. And again, there's different ways that you read. Um, you know, there are different ways that you read your own work. Um, there's the, oh, yeah, I just have to get through it. Um, reading it in light of what you're hoping to accomplish in a day's work. Um, but also trying to put, you know, a sort of a psychic distance um, between yourself and, and, and what you may have written a day before or a year before, um, a kind of stepping away. There's another wonderful thing that Nabokov says about um, what a shame it is that when we read a novel, we can't take it in all at once the way you take in a painting. We have to read it page by page, but wouldn't it be lovely to step back and just sort of take apprehend the entire thing. And I think that kind of stepping back is what you do when, when you're composing the novel, um, just to try to get that, that view of the breadth of it at any point. Um, here's a, here's a, a technical question. Do you outline before you start writing? Do you know the end ahead of time or do you just plot as you go along? Well, plot, hmm, I'm not, I'm not real. <laughs> I, I guess there are plots there. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, maybe even a mystery. Um, I think, you know, outlines, um, again, are something that you might cling to when, when the language is directing you away from your original plans um, and you're slapping it down and saying, no, 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 got to stick to the outline. That's never any fun. That's no fun at a party. That's no fun uh, with friends. And it's no fun for a novelist. Got to stick to the outline. Don't let anything happen that's going to take you out of the end. But there's also, again, we, we want to at least kid ourselves that we know what we're doing. So there is a sense of, all right, well, you know, maybe then there'll be a chapter, this will happen, then there will be a chapter that will happen. So I, I, sometimes I, I plan ahead, but, but I worry about those detailed outlines. Um, and again, something that maybe needs to be um, locked out of the room, plans. Um, plans for the novel, the way you described it to all your friends is the way you're committed to write it. Um, that's going to be boring for all of us, um, especially for the writers. So, so I, I, I love spontaneity. I love surprise. I love it as a reader. Um, and I think that's what we look for as writers. That's really great. I think uh, that's our, I, I'll just ask you one very quick last question, which is, um, Will What About the Baby be available on Audible? Uh, yes. Great. Yes, uh, with a wonderful reader, I believe. Oh, terrific. <laughs> Brad, I'm going to throw it back to you. Thanks, uh, Matt, and, and great, great moderating. Um, and Alice, boy, how lucky we are uh, that you didn't throw away all your lecture notes <laughs> uh, from the Suwannee Writers Conference, conference because uh, now so many uh, more of us can, uh, can read your advice and hopefully channel it into great fiction, you know, language, character, story. That's, that's the magic formula, right? <laughs> uh, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of uh, What About the Baby? And yes, we do have signed copies. Thanks to a store visit today uh, by Alice. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well-read. Thank you.